are now live and going. So, um, so Varsha, you were saying like you're in Berkeley, and so you're seeing kind of the the apocalyptic orange sky. And like, so the air quality you were saying is is really bad, right? So it's just kind yeah. of smoke everywhere. Yeah. Basically, the last time it was measured, at least the last time one of my friends told me what it was, it was five thirty-seven, which is basically you're breathing in smoke. That's basically what it is. I don't know if it's gotten better since this morning, but yesterday, all the pictures you saw yesterday of the red sky, that was real. No one was making up filters from like the Dune fictional series. We were not on Gallif we were not on Gallifrey from Doctor Who. Yeah. We were living like, in a red sky. And it I like initially I was like, man, what is it? Like, is the sun just like not feeling it today? And then apparently the reason you have the red sky is the smoke and the ash. And so basically the smoke and the ash got caught up in a layer of the atmosphere. And so because mm -hmm. the sky is not really blue, the sky is only blue because of the reflection of the light from the sun, the sun was reflecting the light of the ash or the color of the ash. So only the green, only not green, only red rays. I can't, I'm not a scientist. Basically we can only see them. <laughs> That was that was wow. a very thorough actually and, and I mean yeah, and impressed the medievalist yeah. over here. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was good. Okay. All right. Well, we so, should probably introduce our guest. I guess. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we could talk about apocalypse some more. I mean, that that has kind of sci-fi um, uh, implications, right? So, but uh, but anyway, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Marcia, Please. Yeah. So this week we have Julian C. Chambliss, who is a professor of history as well as he's also in the English department, right, at Michigan right. State. Yeah, and so That's you right, work. Yeah. yeah, so you work on comic books, but you also work on basically the built environment, this idea of urban landscapes, and you are also a teacher, and so you wear a lot of hats at Michigan State. So I guess the the easy question to start with is, what are you drinking today? Oh, I'm drinking uh, Tom Collins, which is like a gin drink. You know, gin, soda, simple sugar, little lemon. I'm a big nice gin and, fan, so. Yeah. Nice and refreshing. So do you have a favorite gin that you, you go to? Hendrix is my favorite gin. Hendrix, Hendrix. okay. Yeah. It's a, cl it's a classic, a classic. So right. it mixes well, can drink well by itself and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, you know, Varsha and I, as, as everybody who's watching, I'm sure knows, like we're big whiskey fans. So um, I actually... Um, I did not invent this drink, despite what I said on Twitter. My wife invented this drink. Uh, but it's a variation of an old-fashioned. So it ha we have some bourbon in here. Um, some, we use some maple syrup instead of simple syrup. And then um, okay. an, an Alpine Amaro, which is a, like an herbal liqueur called Braulio, which has a really kind of uh, uh, piney scent to it. So the, the maple and the, uh, the pine mixes really really well and it's it's very delicious and then as backup i, I have some uh some uh, uncle nearest um, tennessee whiskey behind us too so so we'll, we'll get to that in the second half hour but uh, how about you Varsha? Yeah. what are you drinking today? as per usual i am drinking uh the kevin cruz special which is bourbon in a jet with a giant ice cube but this week <laughs> uh instead of uncle nearest this week i'm having blade and bow which is, is incredibly smooth and just like it's becoming one of my fast favorites, which is evident as to how much I have finished of it, even though I bought it <laughs> weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, so I think eventually I need to, as soon as like uh, it starts getting colder here and the smoke starts to disappear, I think I need to go back into drinking scotch because I sort of do miss my scotch days. Yeah. So yeah. there are, it, it's funny because there are drinks, right, that, that, that pair better with different seasons, right? Like, like yeah. scotch, right. like even yeah. this one, which is, which is delicious. Like it, it just tastes like a fall drink to me and it's not fall here yet. So it's just, it's a, I'm a little out of sorts, but. Um, yeah, I used to think scotch was the best winter in DC drink, but I've actually been to DC in the winter and the best winter in DC or winter on the East Coast drink is a mezcal margarita. Oh man. That is good. Mm. Lovely. Margarita is a good drink. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, so Julian, uh, I mean, we could we could just talk about alcohol all all night if you if you want to, um, which you know. Okay. Easy enough, right? Like so. <laughs> 
But but as Varsha said, I mean, you, you wear a lot of hats at Michigan State. You know, you're, you're you're in the history department, you're in the English department. You also work for the Michigan State um, University Museum as its curator of history, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and all of that around this kind of idea of of imagined cities and kind of the built environment and stuff like that. So so how do you see right. that? How does it all kind of tie together in your work? Well, I should clarify that like. I'm in the English department 100% and I have like a okay. zero point uh, appointment in the history department. Uh, okay, so, so if your department job, chair is listening, we don't want you to get in trouble, right, yeah, so sorry. Right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he probably would be listening actually. He's a nice guy, but he, he keeps his eye out, keeps his eye out. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, so the, my approach, I actually wrote my dissertation on planning uh, in the United Ooh. States. And um, if you think about it, a city plan is basically an imaginary, especially the period I studied. I studied early 20th century uh, planning, comprehensive planning, you know, the formation of, of modern planning. And much of that was predicated on an interaction with things like public art and social, um, social movements around cleanliness and beauty. And many of the comprehensive plans relied heavily on artists' representations of an imagined city. And the prime example of this is a plan of Chicago. I wrote about a dissertation. If you ever read the plan of Chicago, what you'll see is that it is a history of the city, of cities writ large, and a really beautiful set of drawings of what the city could look like. Mm. So it's it's a visual narrative about the possibilities of a sort of commercial city. And the idea of the city as a space where um, a sort of visual narrative and the ability to create a visual narrative corresponds with the growth of the city is very important in American context, right? And some level, comics are an archive of the urban experience, like both in terms of mm -hmm. the visual aesthetic that you find in, in comics and the way that they sort of reflect both a commercial demographic and social transformation, right? So so it was not that complicated to me to think about comics as like this sort of artifact of the city. And huh. the same concerns that shape, you know, the activism of people around things like planning, things like social reforms in the city, they play themselves out in sort of themes and practices and characters and and perspectives sort of built into comics, right? And it's a popular medium. It's the medium that many people absorb over their lifetime. And so they have a really strong connection to that visual narrative. So thinking about it in that way um, really sort of got, got me able to sort of, you know, create those sort of connections. So I always say I studied a real and imagined city and okay. the real part is, you know, real places, but the imagined part runs across a gambit of material that's produced in different spaces for different purposes. Um, so yeah, that's how I approach it. So, so, so can I ask you, please go ahead, Varsha. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if you are just a Marvel person, but like when you were talking about like the, the, the issues that are brought up in comics are similar to the real issues that we deal with in cities, like my mind immediately went to Gotham and specifically like not just like Batman comics in general, but also like reinterpretations of the Batman comics, like the film franchise, mm -hmm. as well as the TV show that was like the early history of Gotham because it was before Bruce Wayne became Batman. Um, and basically mm, in yes. all these representations of Gotham, uh, be they good or bad representations, they're all like really desperately concerned about like crime and how the city is effective at dealing with crime or ineffective and so I was just wondering from your like from your research, what do you think people who write comics are generally like concerned about in cities? Or like what do what is the image you get about of cities from the comics that you have looked at? Well, you know, that really depends on the genre, right? So similar to novels, like you know, you get asked the same thing of people who study novels, like so based on your your arena of romance novels, what do people get from the city? <laughs> um and of course, I specialize in superhero comics, right? And so I see the iconic nature of Gotham. And Gotham is a great example, right? The, the, the first two cities and comics are Metropolis and Gotham. And both of those words, of course, are synonyms for New York, right? <laughs> right? So Metropolis 
is um, New York, the good parts, and Gotham is New York, the bad parts, right? Like, you know, cl classically, Denny O'Neill, late great comic book writer, um, editor. I, I think he's credited with saying that, you know, like, you know, or Frank Miller is one or the other. But, but it's a common sentiment that, like, that New York is, Metropolis is New York on a bright, sunny day in the best part of town. And Gotham is the exact opposite, right? It's New York in the worst possible day at night, at midnight, right? Like that, our instinct around Gotham is always to show it at night. And, yeah. and, and much of our, our, our sort of construction of Gotham is really predicated on really like 1920s, 1930s gang line, gangland, um, sort of like crime, right? Like, I used to make this point to students in class, my, my teaching class on superheroes. You know, if you just say Batman's sort of backstory, uh, it sounds like a lot of urban crime narratives. Uh, you know, a young boy out in the street, his parents have gunned down, senseless act of violence. Um, if you say what Bruce Wayne as a grown up adult does, it doesn't sound cool today but it resonates with a kind of sort of middle-class concern about the danger posed by the city. And, and indeed, you know, even in contemporary comics, I think Batman drives into Gotham and he deals with criminals that from a kind of geographic statistical standpoint aren't right. Like if he was going into a city, um, a major American city, in the middle of the night and fighting crime, he should be statistically beating up more black people in the comic book. And he doesn't, right? Because that would look bad because he's a really rich white guy who dresses <laughs> up in a mask and, and spends an enormous amount of money to get weapons and then drives in the middle of the night into the city and just like lays the smack down on a person <laughs> who he thinks is committing a crime. Right, like yeah. he thinks this word is gonna be a crime. Like, mm, if you <laughs> describe that in real life, no, it would not be cool, right? Uh, there was actually a tweet going around, and I think it's gone around for a while. They're like, Batman is just like a cop, like without any justification for his murders, because that's all he like does uh, all the time, uh, instead of just spending. Well, you know, his Batman money, doesn't like, kill better people. Better cop. Oh, Batman true. doesn't kill people. Batman doesn't kill people. Like, like I want to make that clear. My, yeah. my, my, my comic credentials are on the line. <laughs> 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 like, I just think that oh, that's what's... That's unless what's it's an Elseworld about, story, in which case he can't kill people, right? Like, he can kill yeah. people with Elseworld stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what's interesting about Batman, or at least the way that we have, like, interpreted Batman a as a hero, because I'm thinking, like, of the Dark Knight Rises, and specifically this, like, guy who's, like, super damaged, okay. but also, like, very rich, and so he could be <laughs> using his money to better the Warm. city that he supposedly loves, right. but instead he uses it to, you know, play vigilante. And, and so I think that's just personal like, revenge, right? Yeah, um, exactly. And, and, and so I guess... Yeah, so I guess that's my second question. So since you studied superhero comics, why do you think the United States is so into superheroes? Like, does it all stem from Superman fighting the Nazis or is it something else? Oh, no, I don't, I don't think it just stems from that. Um, <clears throat> to go back to your original question, I think one of the things about that you, you get from reading superhero comics is you get a sense of the evolution of the United States as, as a as a country, as a power in the 20th century, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, you can sort of key the emergence of the superhero genre to the rise of the United States as a, as a global power. And, you know, when you look at a character like Superman, that character does capture many of the sort of transformative ideas that are being offered at that moment by a really transformative government, right? Like, you know, the idea of Superman as a New Deal hero. Is, is really a really important one. And, you know, and, and there are lots of, of uh, scholars that have written about this and we can sort of think about Superman sort of embodying sort of transformative rights and the early stories reflecting the values of a kind of New Deal, FDR sort of politics. Now, who is he beating up in those early stories? Like, you know, famously he's, he's, you know, tearing down, broken down housing and building new 
public housing. He's he's stopping war profiteers, you know, gamblers. He's he's preventing someone, a working class person, uh, you know, the common person from being abused by the system. Hmm. The Superman that that we sort of know in the in the terms of like you know fighting supervillains is a evolution of that character, but his roots are very much you know very much reflecting that kind of. A New Deal politic and, and a transformative figure with the power of representing the people does resonate and, and kind of align with what FDR seemed to be to a lot of people. Well, not to everybody, but he was that for a lot of Americans. And then Batman, in some ways, is an amalgamation of previous sort of pulp characters created in the mold, in the mold sort of like shaped by by Superman, right? Like we we need another we need another one of these superhero characters, right? And Bob Kane borrows and, and gets gets assistance from um, his collaborators, you know, and and you get a Batman character, which you know borrows from things like horror films. You know, Batman fights like werewolves and <laughs> things yeah. in his early career. And so you know these are very much sort of mass entertainment stories that are, are speaking to a public uh, at the moment in the lab part of the Great Depression and almost out of World War II. And then World War II, you get a lot of nationalist narratives in superhero media because you have a lot of nationalist narrative, narratives in all media. And mm -hmm. famously, you know, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon have Captain America punch Hitler. You know, Jewish Americans very much aware of what's happening in Germany, as many Jewish Americans were aware of what's happening in Germany. And very strongly anti-Hitler, right? Even before the mainstream Americans who you know rejected the idea of allowing uh, people trying to escape from Germany, Jews trying to escape from Germany, coming to the United States, right? We forget, but that was the truth. And he says it was very high. And you know these artists are trying to respond, and they're doing it with the work that they do, like they make comics. So they made a comic with a character that punches Hitler. And then as, as, the, as the genre evolves and the country is going into things like the post-war, Cold War dynamic, the characters continue to reflect that, right? We do have that sort of decline and the rise of the horror comic and, and the Wortham scare. But, you know, I always think about Marvel as a very much capturing a kind of Cold War science competition. Like every one of the Marvel heroes is a scientist, right? So it's like, you don't have to think too hard about what, what's driving some of this. And it's a mass, it is a mass, a very much a mass, mass publication. It, it's intended yeah. for a lot of people. And, and though defined um, by juvenile readership, you know, in the early periods, everyone read comics, right? The, our numbers are, are, are amazing. A hundred million copies um, being sold in a year or, or, you know, you know when you, there's different calculations, but there's a great new project from uh, Brooks Hefner called Circulating American Magazines. And he has um, publication data and he can, because Batman and Superman and Captain Marvel were selling so much, they are sort of like single things that you can see in the circulation data from like the 1920s to the 1970s. And there's a period where they're just like out there, you can see how they're selling all across the country and they're massive numbers, right? So it's it's a popular narrative that 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 provides an amazing sort of um, insight into a kind of consumer culture, but also a, a kind of popular culture where ideas about the United States, which again, American popular culture often, I think, does a great job of capturing um, sentiments and aspirations and, and anxieties related to the United States and, and comics are, are a part of that. Yeah. One more question and then Please. Matt can go. So sorry. Okay, so somebody mentioned this in the in the Q&A and now I'm really interested in it. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how is like Matt Murdock, Dare, Daredevil and like fighting crime in, in Hell's Kitchen uh, and also the whole Hell's Kitchen, like the different superheroes that are in Hell's Kitchen Including different from your... <laughs> Yeah, like I'm sorry, but it's Clinton now, so it's not really that tough of a neighborhood. And I really, I just like to point that out. I mean, yes, yeah. okay, go on. I know. Um, 
Go on. <laughs> Sorry. Like this, there's a real geography here with Marvel. It, it's really complicated. But go on. Go on. Go on. Yeah. So that's my question. Is like, uh, how is Hell's Kitchen different? And I also just to tack onto that question, Luke Cage is in Hell's Kitchen, right? Like a uh, Power Man um, or Luke Cage. He's in Harlem. Wondering, he's in Harlem, and so I was just wondering. Uh, since he's one of the fr or the first black superhero, right? I was just wondering if if you've like uh, seen sort of some sort of difference in 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 how he's portrayed as a superhero versus how white superheroes are portrayed. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So there is a great. Uh, we did a, a series at the African American Intellectual History Society uh, blog called Black Perspective, and we talked a, a, a good bit about Luke Cage. Luke Cage is the superhero. He's the first black superhero on the cover of a comic book. The first black superhero character is mm -hmm. is actually Black Panther, right? Oh, right. Mm -hmm. um, right, and and there's an earlier character, a character called Lion Man. Who appeared in a comic called All Negro Comics Number One? One issue came out in 1947, and he's arguably a kind of proto. He was black before Black Panther, right? It was published by African American publisher out of Philadelphia, Or Evans, but no one's no one's very few people have ever seen it. But you can download it for free. So if you Google All Negro Comics Number One, you can you can usually find it online as a PDF. You can download it. Um, there's also uh, Neil Knight, who was a newspaper comic strip that was in the Pittsburgh Courier in the early 50s, a very Flash Gordon character, a black fighter pilot who was morphed into a Flash Gordon kind of character who fought aliens and things. Uh, another character that most people have never heard of, but the first superhero character with his own book is Luke Cage. And you know, Luke Cage was revolutionary at the moment that he was introduced because he was the first Black superhero with his own book. And he was clearly a reaction to uh, the Black Power movement, right? So if you've ever seen Shaft, the movie with Richard Roundtree, bad mother, you know, Shaft, then you know the <laughs> basic premise of Luke Cage. Luke Cage is a detective with an office over a movie theater who has a, a, a sidekick, uh, unfortunately named D.W., as in D.W. Griffin, right? You know, because uh, D.W. Griffin, super racist, right? Like, you know, Birth of a Nation, that, that, that D.W. Griffin, right? Yeah. Um, but he is a wrongly imprisoned African-American who's experimented on in, in prison who get his power. And I always like go back to that first issue and talk about Luke Cage, because in that issue, you can see an effort on the part of the writers to recognize a kind of black social politic of the late 60s, early 70s, right? The, the, the warden that comes in is a reformer. And that's a, re a reaction to Attica, which had just happened. Mm -hmm. Right, the Attica mm -hmm. prison rights and their demands for reform and inhumane treatment, right? And you think about work like Michelle Alexander's Jim Crow um, and work on Jim Crow and incarceration, mass incarceration. Like, these are old ideas, but, you know, they had a moment in the 1970s where, again, at, at the end of a long period of, like, social um, reform and, and social campaigning, uh, rights campaigns, you know, this was an immense, immense moment for a number of people, both black and white, in terms of like trying to envision a better society. And, and even Luke Cage, who's a incredibly problematic character, um, you know, he loses his, his, his shirt in a heartbeat in that comic. He always ends up shirtless. His clothes get destroyed. Um, his costume has a chain, which, you know, for a black male character, to have like, you know, iron, you know, steel skin and incredible strength. And, you know, it's a reference to a lot of um, ideas around the black buck, you know, physical power. Um, and indeed, you know, Luke Cage has smarter people around him, right? The doctor who gave him his powers, the lawyer he ends up working for, Hogarth. Um, 
And, but at the same time, he is powerful in a world that up until that moment, if you were a black male and you were powerful, you would automatically be killed, right? It wouldn't even be a question. Like just, just having too much power was a reason to kill you. That explained, you know, mass lynching of the late 19th, early 20th century, right? And so to see a character like that in comics, mirroring some of the things you were seeing in the films, like, you know, Melvin Van People's sweet, sweet back badass song, you know, that character broke every law, slept with white women, beat up the police and got away at the end. People were shocked about that, right? Like, you just didn't see it in movies, right? That was the, yeah. the most successful independent film of 1970, you know, 1970, I think. Um, so, you know, the idea of what what was expected in terms of Black black characters across all kinds of media has to be taken into account when you see a Luke Cage, even though I can look at Luke Cage and go, he's got an afro. He says, sweet Christmas. That's not a curse any black person would use. Um, <laughs> that outfit is like horrible, but he's also got power in a world that previously denied all black people, and especially black men power, right? Mm -hmm. And we can yes, poke at it endlessly and be like, oh. but <laughs> it does make a certain kind of sense. Whereas Daredevil is a very different character. I love Daredevil. I've always been a huge Daredevil fan. Um, Daredevil does represent and tap into a kind of, again, a kind of urban thick mythology about the city, right? Uh, there, is, there is this sort of idea of a kind of whiteness that washes, a, that, that exists in the American context. You know, we think about the melting pot, but there's also a very strong white ethnic mythology associated with the United States. And when you look at a character like Daredevil, his Catholicism, his sort of working class, you know, battling a persona, uh, he makes himself good, right? His father was a, a horrible boxer, and, but he has become and worked very hard, overcome a lot, including like, you know, a disability and now he's a lawyer that fights for the downtrodden against like the sort of system that would exploit them. And that's that's a character that that resonates a great deal with people and and, and makes a lot of sense in terms of like a, a, that kind of idea of like the United States is a place where you can better yourself. But at the same time, you know, there are this these this this sort of sense in the super comics are there are people who are beyond the confines of the system and, and they need correcting. And I'll be honest with you, when you think about that, that appeal of the superhero and you think about our current president and the way that people often refer to him about like, oh, well, he's outside the system and he's tearing it down. These ideas have a long, very complicated legacy in the American popular mind, right? That the outsider yeah. who's not corrupted by the system do something. And and the and the use of jingoistic language or or negative reference politics as I used to, as I learned it in graduate school, um, like you know I hate these people I know you hate these people so vote for me kind of thing. Uh, those are not new ideas, right? Those are old ideas. Yeah. Uh, and and so when we look at when I look at a superhero character, you know I can see the the good and the bad in those characters in the sense that they're representing and capturing a, a set of cultural narratives around space and place, identity, and aspirations that we have for ourselves as, as a country. So, so can I, um, so I want to have, make sure we have time for Q and A because we have some great questions here from, from the audience, but, but I wanted to, something that you've kind of touched on a few times. And so I was wondering if you could kind of expand on that is, is the way that, that, um, the stories of specific superheroes, um, both within comic books and then kind of in the expanded universe, like TV shows, movies, and stuff like that, the way that they accrete, right? So that it's not just Batman. Like when you say Batman, there's, there's many Batmans, like of different kinds. Oh, he's changing his background, that's awesome. Um, so, <laughs> so um, right, and so so how do you, like when you're, when you're trying to teach, um, you know, kind of the story of the superhero, is that I would assume that a lot of the students and, and, and maybe, you know, a bunch of our, our audience members as well, like they don't know all the different versions of that. And so how do they, they kind of play together? Because the comic books are so, they're so intertextual in the way that they reference kind of, kind of different things. And so how do you, how do you kind of pull 
people through that, you know, if, if somebody's just dipping their toe in or, or just wants to know a little bit more about these different characters? Right, well, you know, comics are intertextual, sure, and they also are not, <laughs> right? So okay, sure, fair, thing, yeah. Well, well, okay, one of the ways I, I try to explain to students is that they're, we can use a kind of uh, a broad historical framework to understand comics. And, and, and comics is a, a description of a, a medium, and then there's mm. genres, right? Okay. So I always like this differentiate, like when we're talking about comics in the United States, early comics are newspaper comics, right? They're comic strips. And so there's a set of cultural expectations around comic strips and newspaper. One, they're not necessarily juvenile. Right, so right away you can sort of think about well, who's reading the newspaper? It ain't necessarily kids, yeah. right? They might read the Sunday paper, but it's it's not juvenile. And like, there's a different cultural connotation to the people who are producing those those works mm. for that audience. And then when you have the comic book, that too in the golden age isn't necessarily juvenile. Everybody reads comics: adults, kids, black, white, you know, many different ages, right? And, and the comics of the golden age are a number of different genre in that medium, right? So you got cowboy comics, you got toy comics, you got, you know, product, you know, product placement in comics started really early, right? Like Walt Disney comics, you know, <laughs> Donald <laughs> Duck, you know, comics based on television shows, Car 54, like, you know, comics yeah. based on, you know, all these things, like, that's been in comics for forever. It's not a new thing. Um, the, the, the sort of reoccurring character, you know, single, single character comic, as opposed to anthology, a lot of early comic books that were very successful in the Golden Age were anthology, right? They might have, like, a main character that people knew, but they also probably had four or five other stories in them, right? Action comic was an anthology publication. Right? Mm. So, so there are lots of different characters in, 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 in the comic, right? But sure. the single issue comic has continuity, right? Like one issue, two issue, three issue. And that, that character, that version of the character is the character that, that version is the character that, that most people know. So I always like to point out to people that like the Dark Knight Returns is an Elseworlds story. It's an Elseworlds story. So it's a make-believe story of a make-believe universe. Right, so it is not intended to be the story of the mainline Batman comic. The mainline Batman comic coming out at the same time had none of that, right? So it was its mm -hmm. own special thing. Where and the reason that our creators like to do that is because like they're not hemmed in by the expectations that the audience has about the character, right? It takes a lot. It it takes a lot to do something new with a character everyone knows. Right. And so, you know, the Elseworlds story becomes like this great creative freedom. And some of them are so great that, you know, some of those Elseworlds stories are so impactful that traits that are introduced in those stories get imported into the main character, one, the one that stays very stable. And this is the case of The Dark Knight Returns of Batman. Because if yeah. you go back in time before that and, 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 and say, are Batman and Superman enemies? The answer is no. They're very, they're very tight. They're, they're good friends. Right? Like, they do, they, do not have, they do not have beef with each other. Yeah. That was Frank Miller. <laughs> Frank Miller looked at them and go like, well, do you don't feel like these people would be, they would be like friends. You know, he, he doesn't think that. There's good reason that the not think that but he's the writer he he gets to act on it right and yeah. he has his own set of politics right and so but that story is so iconic that every writer after that goes like oh yeah batman and superman have like a little antagonism they do in frank miller's mind and now they do it all of our minds but if you go back yeah. to early superman batman stories they are not even with each other so it's cool but it's, that's the way that you can sort of think about, like there are key moments, key stories where important issues within the larger culture are infused into the, the, the canon, infused into, into the character. And that spins off and creates a kind of space for that character to, to tell and, and reflect different ideas. And, and Batman, 
being more popular than Superman forever. Superman was the more popular character. And then like in the 1980s, Batman hops to the front and Batman has remained in the front as like a, a, arguably a more popular character with people because of this sort of like darker, more paranoid, I would argue, more traumatized, right? More yeah. traumatized. You remember the Batman TV show with Adam West? That's a great show that operates on many different levels. But so, and the book can watch that and the kid can watch it and they can both enjoy it. Uh, but the Batman in that, in that, and that TV show is not necessarily traumatized by the fact he saw his parents murdered, right? And that and that was true that the Batman of a huge swath of the 50s, 60s, right? but yeah. it's not, it doesn't seem to be tortured in the same way like Batman of the 70s and 80s is, right? Who's a, who, who with like Denny O'Neill and Adam, um, Neil Adams becomes a much darker character who loses his teen sidekick who was added on so he wouldn't seem scary at the very beginning, right? Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, so there's, there's ways where the characters are evolving. So when you look at it historically, you can sort of go through, think about certain characters as a, as a sort of internal canon and look for transformation. And also different publishers bring a different emphasis, as we often say when we look at Marvel and it's sort of like emphasis on the stories being set in the world just like ours, but just a little bit more fantastic. Like that's really yeah. was the goal that they have. And that is not the goal for DC Comics, it is not. DC Comics sets its stories in imaginary worlds. That's why all the cities are not named after real places, right? Like Metropolis, Central City, Up City, right? They're all yeah. imagined, they're representative spaces and they have almost deity-like characters, right? Like gods and, and, and demons and things like that. And so the goals yeah. for the publisher are, are really infused into the characters and story worlds. And we can see that when we look at superheroes. And so, you know, even smaller um, indie publishers, uh, I think, you know, you think about a milestone comics of the early 90s when they wanted to create a more a multicultural superhero world, they, they, they created their own world they, and they created their own story world. And they were quite successful, but, you know, it's a it's a it's a mix of like thinking about periodization, thinking about disruption in terms of the of the of the the comics, and pointing to key moments like when was the first time that a black person actually showed up as opposed to the analogous alien or something or you know what about this sort of transformation in the depiction of women, uh, what are the themes like you know Vietnam War like how did that change in their in terms of representation, traumas of all kinds and all sorts how they you know, socially relevant stories. There's there's ways that we you can make your way through, and actually returning to a character like Batman, returning to a character like Superman, returning to a character like Spider Man, gives you a chance to sort of see how those characters who represent something that people think they know, mm -hmm. how do they handle these new expectations around these these sort of social issues? Yeah. So, so I mean, that's a really interesting distinction. And if I'm understanding you correctly, right, it's not so much, I mean, that, that the stories are creep, though they, maybe they do, they kind of pile on, but they, they're kind of placed next to each other, right? So there's, there's multiple, right. like, there's multiple worlds of Batman that exist kind of simultaneously, and some become more popular and some become kind of fall by the wayside. Yeah, like I that. mean, a prime example of this is Harley Quinn. Mm -hmm. I don't know any most people know who Harley Quinn is, but they don't know where Harley Quinn comes from. So this is a test, kids. Where does Harley <laughs> Quinn come from? Where does Harley Quinn come from? Come on. You guys love comics. Where does Harley Quinn come from? Come on. Come on. It's Bruce the Q&A is Batman deathly silent, so. <laughs> oh, there it is. Matthew Toyx. She Tim. got it. There you yeah, go. Bruce yeah, Bruce Tim, the Batman animated series. So if you go and Google Bruce Timm's Harley Quinn, look at that character, and then look at any version of Harley Quinn you, you see, you go like, wait, what? <laughs> right? Because the thing that really transformed Harley Quinn wasn't a comic book. It was Rocksteady games. Right? It was Rocksteady <laughs> because like they put Harley Quinn in the video games. And a lot of students who I get in a class and I'm t talking about Batman, they have never read a Batman comic book. 
They didn't play the Harkham Knight games, though. They played all the Arkham games, and they watched the movie, so they know Batman. And I'm like, yeah. well, oh, okay, okay, but... <laughs> <laughs> and there's you know 80 years of written stuff related to batman and outside gonna, of video games really yeah, yeah I mean, so we're, gonna, we're, we're gonna have to dig into that um sorry we're not gonna, we're not gonna play any video games in here uh but you know the idea of transmedia characters are related to something like uh <laughs> these is not new either, right? Like Superman had a radio program almost immediately. Uh, where he hit out with his friend Batman, I like to point out. Like, again, they did not hate each other until Frank Miller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, wait, it's like, I'm gonna re repeat that. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to think about those characters and these sort of like transmedia objects and each iteration that transmedia object gets reflected sometimes in comics, right? That, that's true with Superman. There are certain elements that were created for the radio show that go into the comic. And it's true with Harley Quinn. The way Harley Quinn looks now, I argue has more to do with Rocksteady games and their artist artist ditches of uh, Harley Quinn than mm. it has anything to do with Bruce Timm and his version of Harley Quinn, right? Mm. And so the animated version of Harley Quinn, the video game version of Harley Quinn, the movie version of Harley Quinn, and the comic version of Harley Quinn are all in dialogue. And there's a meta Harley Quinn in there. Um, but it really depends on where you first see her, because I remember watching the Batman animated series, which I love, uh, which is on Netflix now. Um, <laughs> and that's a really great series, really, really slim, very clean drawing style. Um, but then you, you track down how Harley Quinn evolves across platforms, and then you look at the movie version of Harley Quinn, especially in the first Suicide Squad movie, you go like, oh, okay, that's that's more rock steady games than it is um, yeah. any comic book version. Now the comic book version sort of looks like the movie version for obvious reasons, right? Yeah. So so kind of going back to one of the questions that that came up, and it, this I think it may maybe slightly changes the direction of the, the conversation, but I think it's it's sort of related too. Is um, was about, uh, I think about, uh, you know, you were talking at the very beginning about the way that the real world, for example, like, like Metropolis and Gotham, like influenced by New York City, right? And, and how like it was transported into the comic book. Have, have you seen examples of, of how it works kind of the other way is that like this world of, of superheroes, for example, is, is so kind of infused within pop culture that, that you're seeing the translation of that back into the real world. And uh, the question um, by this, this, this lovely person by the name of Rachel Gabriel, who's my wife, is, is about, <laughs> for example, um, uh, Akon's uh, utopian city in Senegal that he's, he's right. kind of creating out of thin air, which is like this, this kind of crazy weird fantastical thing like and not specifically that but like like how does it how does it move does it move both ways now i guess that's a really good question i think one way you can think about this is in the sense of you know there are especially in the context of marvel books you can buy excuse me books you can buy or tours you can go on in new york city that correspond to where the stuff in marvel comics is Right. Oh, yeah, okay. So there's, yeah, a, sure. there's, there's, a, there's a walking to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so in that regard, like, you know, that sort of visual reference of New York as a character in Marvel Comics is, is very true. But some of the things that make superhero comics, superhero comics almost can't necessarily exist in the real world, especially in terms of the spaces, right? Um, some, of the, some of the aspirations around superheroes and the technology they represent. I mean, it's always this recurring thing that like Elon Musk is the real life Iron Man. And I'm like, mm, not really. But but I understand where that impulse comes from, right? Um, this, I, this sort of like idea of things like unstable molecules or invisibility, right? Like I remember mm -hmm. years ago, it was a few years ago, there was a researcher that was trying to work on like a kind of like a light reflecting material and in the description of it, you the know, invisibility kind of cloak, right? Woman. Yeah, invisibility yeah, yeah, cloak, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so now in that I'm regard, <laughs> <laughs> in that regard, you know, the sort of fantastic sign and comics are 
no sci-fi literature, right? There's sci-fi poems at some level. Um, that that happens. The actual physical mimicking of of the the superhero city. Yeah, you know that's a great question. I think one of the things about the superhero city is that it's cre- continuously destroyed and rebuilt. And if mm. and and in the mm-hmm. real world, you know the the kind of trauma associated with that destruction. We've seen it in real life, and of course, we don't want to relive it, right? Yeah. And 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 in superhero comics, city New York has been destroyed and recreated enough times that is a thing, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's and it's interesting actually. I, I have a colleague, Martin Lund, who wrote a great piece, a great essay about like this this destructive, you know, just blowing things up, like the destructive nature and and calamity. We talked a lot about calamity as a a, a mode in comics, mm. and part of the part of the escape of comics is that like no matter how bad it gets destroyed, by the next issue is is back to normal, right? And one of the things about I think the the median age of comics um, rising because now kids aren't all, aren't often associated with reading comics like the average comic reader is probably in their thirties or older uh, for superhero comics. That's not true for every comic genre, but superhero comics. Yeah. Is that questions around things like trauma are way more prominent in the storyline. Like uh-huh. they they actually they actually talk about, well, you know, if you fight evil all the time, like Batman does, um, what's the cost of that, right? Like there's a cost to like sure. looking at something really horrible all the time. And and we, we think about that in real life with first responders, especially in troubling times like this, how are they handling the trauma of doing that? And, and increasingly, I think, in trying to tell more sophisticated superhero stories, you can see things like Heroes in Crisis is a series where they sort of dealt with this idea of like superheroes do get trauma. And they have to go someplace to work on that, right? Um, and so it's, it's interesting. I'm gonna have to think about that. I haven't really, I haven't really thought about like superhero city sort of imposing itself on the real world. What would that look like beyond technology? Like in terms of design? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think there are places where fantastic design that supersedes people's expectations in terms of aesthetics, mm, like at Abu Dhabi sure. or Dubai, yeah. uh, yeah. a kind of speculative architecture is really important. And, and that makes sense in those contexts because those places are, are mildly trying to outstrip outsiders' view of that place, right? So a spectacular architecture, a speculative architecture, a future-oriented architecture is a way to, to do that. Um, yeah. But at the same time, like, you know, we don't have helicarriers, even though I think that would be cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we, we don't, we, you know, we don't have like something like the Fantastic Four in New York, uh, you know, like, you know, super science, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, a commercial <laughs> residential area. No, like, you know, he has a nuclear reactor in that building. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> he cannot do that. He has a portal <laughs> to a dark, another dimension in that building. And if they open it, the world will blow up. No. You cannot permit that in New York City. No. What what an amazing series though to go to the, the city council meetings in which you try to get the permit for that, right? <laughs> like, no. I'm sorry, Dr. Richard, but no, that's uh, no. Not really work for me. Uh, oh, okay. So yeah. <laughs> okay, so I have to ask about this because now like I'm thinking about um so I wanted to ask about this at the beginning. So we talked about Luke Cage, but I wanted to talk about Luke Black Panther, but like not just about okay. like the representation of, of race in comics, um, because we all know that like apparently like the, n- the name of the Black Panther comics came out before the Black Panther Party, right? So like they're not supposed to be related, obviously. Like Stan Lee was like, no, I wasn't referencing the party. But still, the movie references the party because the movie begins in Oakland, right? <laughs> and right. then, so that's, so part of my question is, um, from Luke Cage all the way to Black Panther, what what is like, rep, what is how is race used in comics, and how do how is race used to talk? How are how are comics used to talk about race? Do they talk about race well? Do they talk about it like really badly? 
And then my next question is, is Wakanda like the real like utopian city as like somebody who studies planet? Like, is it like really good at being a city? Um, well, I'll, I'll do, I'll do with the, the second question first. Right? Like, <laughs> is, is Wakanda uh, a good city? You know, Wakanda, and, and this will go back to your first question, right? There's a method to my madness. Um, Wakanda is a stereotypical, when it's introduced, let me preface this, let me preface this internet. I'm prefacing this internet. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? We'll, we'll put your Twitter handle on this after so they can respond if you want, right? Okay, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> when it's introduced, when Wakanda is introduced by two white creators, it's a white person's imagining of a post-colonial Africa, right? Like, and in fact, it's, it's, it's a, a white person's imagining of the consequences of colonial, like so, it's 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 almost like a, a kind of psychic acknowledgement of a, imperialism and its uh, impact, and so in that way, it is an important sort of like um, moment in in popular culture, right? Like two white Jewish curators, Jack Kirby, and Stan Lee, um, are looking at an Africa that's coming out of imperial rule right like you know this is a period where like lots of african countries are freeing themselves corresponding to an american civil rights movement and they go like you know um they invent a place that's never been conquered by white people and it's spectacularly advanced now that premise recognizes the destructive nature of colonial exploitation and the stifling created by white people's exploitation Mm -hmm. and slavery and all these other things right and we can look at Jack Kirby, who, you know, in the Black Panther, does what he does, right? He, Kirby Crackle, uh, but mar- he sort of marries sort of like tribal symbols and, and, and super science that he loves so much to create this sort of Wakanda world. But it's in the middle of Africa, right? So it's in the heart of Africa. Mm-hmm. So think about, yeah. you know, Conrad's heart of Africa. <laughs> this unknowing, penetrable place, this alien, right? Like it's literally in the heart of Africa, and that's the reason it hasn't been conquered, right? It's in the middle of the Africa, and it has this incredibly rare, rare, rare um, element, right? What vibranium, right? So you know the resource curse, which you, which we can associate with Africa and its continuing troubles, and uh, everything is in there, but they're just twisting a little bit, right? So it's literally in the middle of Africa. They've never been conquered. They have this resource that allows them to, to have all this sort of super science and stuff. And so it is it is about kind of white people's imagining freedom. And when you look at Black Panther, what you can see is what happens with like black characters writ large, right? Almost every black character of the sort of like introductory period, like the late 60s, early 70s, is created in mainstream superhero comics by a white person. Right, Black Panther, Luke Cage, right, white people, white people, and who's writing them? White people. These are white people of good conscience. Like these are white people who are seeking a kind of progressive politic, but it's white people. It's white people, white people, white people, white people, white people, white people, white people. I don't think Black Panther gets written by a black person until the 1990s, and I think I'm pretty sure that's Christopher Priest. Christopher Priest was the first black person to write Black Panther. And he's writing Black Panther like 1996, seven, perhaps. Um, so he's the first black person to get the right Black Panther part. So what you see when you see black characters in comics, in superhero comics, is different than uh, independent comics, which are, you know, uh, a place where you do see more creators of color, right? You, you think about independent black and white comics, think about Love and Rockets with the Fernandez brothers, right? Uh, there are some underground comics written, created by black people. My my colleague, John Jennings, is is has done a lot with sort of like recovering some of these, these comic book characters mm-hmm. that maybe one, two, three issues that you've never heard of. Uh, but for these sort of mainstream major publishers, these black characters are few and far between, and they're often fitting into a kind of white social liberal vision of, of race, right? So they're just like us and we can feel good about having them as friends. I mean, the Falcon is my favorite 
I love the Falcon, oh, but okay. you know, he's the sidekick to Captain America, who's who is in Marvel Comics like like a Superman, right? He's the he's the a kind of national paragon kind of character. Yeah. And and to have him partnered with um the Falcon, you know, Captain America and the Falcon in the seventies is a is a nod towards a kind of a racial conciliate reconciliation, right? Like a a kind of biracial politic that 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 many <laughs> white people wanted and, and, and aspired for uh, in the 1960s. And with the Black Power movement, they shift those characters, right? They they all become characters. Even the Falcon becomes a character that fights against the man at some level, right? Um, you know, a character like Luke Cage is very much referencing that sort of Black Power movement, that kind of Black aesthetic that white yeah. people are, and, and, and they're misinterpreting that that Black Power movie critique, right? Like, they're they're fixating on the aesthetic, they're fixating on the Afro, they're missing the sort of political critique around class and, and structural racism, right? Yeah. Um, and so Black characters get to be there uh, in the 60s and 70s, and they get to sort of do the things that white characters do for the most part. Um, they might deal with racial issues, but they always go back to like, we can all get along, right? It's really when you start to see black people write the characters that like, you know, some of the more cutting critiques of the nature of racism come through. And yeah. Christopher Priest in Black Panther is a prime example. Like, you know, his run on Black Panther is classic in part because like he introduces this white character that says, and he, and he says it, the reason he introduces this character um, Ever K. Ross is because he wanted a white character who would say all the things that white people are thinking, all the racist mm -hmm. things that white people are thinking, right? And so when you read that his run of Black Panther, initially, you know, Ever K. Ross is saying all kinds of like racist stuff. By the time you get to the end of that series, like, you know, he's he's incredibly um, friend to the Black Panther, but you know, having that character there and that voice is a way for him to sort of address the sort of hidden racism that, that a white reader might have about black characters. Um, that's not always the case in the sense that, you know, I, again, I, I point to Milestone as, as every comics fan of a certain age will you know, you talk about Milestone, Dwayne McDuffie, um, Dennis Cowan, those, those, those creators created an incredibly diverse and interesting story world with characters that took off the mantle of all these sort of iconic figures. Like they had a, their, their version of Superman character, Icon. They had their version of an Iron Man character, Hardware. They had a version of a, a teen character, Static, right? Uh, and told stories that really mattered to um, people of every color, but were realistic, I think, in their concerns to, to the, tr the trials and tribulations that people of color have and the experience that people in urban areas that are very multi 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 ethnic and very next uh, textured and nuanced were um and so you know and that that doesn't even take into account the wide and complicated world of independent comics that are creator own and independent series that are, are trying to tell stories brother man another comic that incredibly sophisticated and and sort of artistic style and it's sort of like uh, ability to capture the the spirit and meaning of hip hop culture and telling a stories of really a stories of social uplift uh, mm -hmm. in a, in the 1990s a huge independent comic success um, and then today of course you know you you see comics by creators you know coming out of independent publishers like Image really digging deep in social issues right you know I think about Bitterroot um, Chuck Brown David F Walker you know very sophisticated storytelling that takes into account a kind of like racial logic and um, racism and so social social questions related to that. You know, LGBTQ issues with, with something like um, Lumberjanes or um, the Viking, there's a, what's it called, Valkyrie? Mm. I just did a, uh, there's a great comic that's sort of like a, a like a queer Viking story that as a female character huh. it's from this this comic I'm gonna forget but it's a great comic I, and you can download the first issue for free oh, I need to look it up now damn it okay hold on a second <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I think well, we, yeah, we're out of time, right? <laughs> well, I was gonna, I was gonna say, I mean, like you actually, I mean, a lot of people were asking about um, kind of the the introduction of of creators of color like into the industry and kind of the impact of that. And I mean, I, I think you kind of you were talking about that, the way that it it, it um, has changed the way the storytelling has happened and the way that the stories are are, are told. So, I mean, I, I think we we have like we we are unfortunately out of time. I mean, there's a million other questions here. We have 39 other really great questions too i mean like i would love to talk about kind of the subversion of the genre like things like watchmen and um uh, the boys which is like an amazon tv show right oh, which yeah. is uh you know things like that like there would be so much more to talk about but unfortunately i think we should we should let uh, julian and, and and other people kind of get on with their evening so um this has been fucking awesome so so thank you so okay. much for for joining us um and for everybody uh, uh watching at home um you know, this will be up on YouTube tomorrow. We'll be, we'll be, our next episode will be in two weeks. Uh, stay tuned on Twitter or on our mailing list in order to, to see our next guest because we haven't figured out who that will be yet, uh, but we'll do that soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> but until then, um, have a wonderful evening. Um, stay safe, everyone. Wear a mask and let me say cheers. Cheers. Thanks cheers. so much, Julian. This is great. Thank you.